The Seattle Mariners ended the 2024 season on a very frustrating note, once again missing the playoffs. The starting rotation was the best the franchise had ever seen, one through five. All of those guys year in and year out are going to be Cy Young contenders. On the flip side, they had one of the worst offensive seasons that the Mariners had ever seen and that baseball had ever seen. In today's episode, I have a great conversation with Gary Hill Jr., a producer and broadcaster for the Mariners, recapping the 2024 season, as well as previewing what to expect this coming offseason. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below on the Mariners season, what you think they'll do this offseason, and what to expect for next year. And if you enjoyed the episode, make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM for more content like this. And if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, I myself am a mortgage broker full-time. That's my full-time career. You can reach out. My contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, Gary, thank you for joining me. I know it's been a little while that I've since I've had you on. But uh, looking forward to recapping this eventful 2024 season. We'll get into the 2023 season a bit and just kind of talk through the similar similarities, the contrast, and really getting to hear some of the insights. I'm super interested to hear about what it was like in the clubhouse and the front office after that coaching change. There was clearly a difference on the offensive side of the ball in those two parts of the year, really. But let, let's let's start with the end of the season. Your initial takeaways as the Mariners are once again eliminated from the playoffs this year. Uh, really frustrating. Uh, really frustrating. Uh, maddening. Sadness. You know, a lot of those things for, for a number of reasons. One is you think about the expectations coming into the season, and I don't think I was alone. I had really high expectations for what this team would be, and that was playoffs. Now, I think my personal philosophy is, and we see this play out, especially the last few years, once you get to the playoffs, it's it's a crapshoot. It's anyone's game. But you got to get there. That's the trick. You got to get there and give yourself an opportunity. And I thought this team was good enough to do it. And it was happening during the course of this season. I mean, they had – it's wild to look back on and think about the 10-game lead at one point for the Mariners. And at that point, it never felt like – they had hit their stride yet. It didn't feel like they had played their best baseball yet because of the offensive struggles. And I guess there were two ways to look at it. One way was the bottom could fall out and they could really struggle. And the other way to look at it, and this is how I was looking at it at the time, well, the offense is going to have to get better. And if the offense gets better, they could actually play better. And what this, what could this lead look like? And you were thinking at the time, hey, maybe they're competing not only for a division, but also for one of the top two spots and a buy, you know, it was those kind of conversations that we're thinking about. So at the end of the season, when you don't make it in, it's not only the expectations during the course of the year, but it's how the year transpired and how it developed that really added to the frustration level. And for me, you know, <laughs> I just hurt for Mariners fans like I want Mariner fans to have the experience of the postseason and have the experience of those great moments that you'll never forget. And we had some of those two years ago with Cal Raleigh and, you know, going to the postseason and those moments in Toronto. And I was hoping this would be a year that we would see that again. And once you get to the postseason, you never know what's going to happen. And heartbreak could await. Ask the Brewers. They've been through it a ton, for example. But it could be a World Series year, too. You just never know. And I'm convinced when – and this is the other part of the frustration for me because when I look at the American League, it's wide open, wide open. I mean, look at what the Tigers have done, making it to the second round. And there is a case to be made that this exact Mariners team could be in that position had they gotten in. I think there's a very good case considering their starting rotation and specifically how they played offensively at the mm -hmm. end of the season. So those are kind of the things I've been thinking about at the end of the year, just reflecting on the season. It's just, it's frustrated. It's really frustrating. And I'm frustrated for Mariners fans because they deserve a playoff run. And I wish we could have seen one. You make it into, into the playoffs. You're the Tigers. You end up sweeping the Astros in Houston. You yep. know, as you mentioned, they're on to the next round with the Mariners starting rotation that they have. No matter which guy, one through five, is, is starting a game, you have the best starting pitcher that's probably going to be starting that game unless you're going against you know some of the top, top guys. But even Bryce Miller, you look at his numbers. His sophomore campaign is one of the best in Mariners history. 
Mm -hmm. Look at Brian Wu's numbers. If he logged a few more innings and qualified in certain areas, like Bryce Miller and Brian Wu are two of the best pitchers in all of baseball. And those are your four and fives. And, but you know, the Mariners can flaunt that they've recorded their four straight winning season, matching the franchise record for most consecutive winning seasons in a row since 2000 and 2003, but to, to, uh, 2021 eliminated game 162. 2022, they made the playoffs and were, uh, you know, lost against the Astros. 2023, eliminated game 161. 2024, eliminated game 160. Mm -hmm. Let's let's kind of dive into. I mean, there's a tale of like kind of three three parts to it. Um, before the season started, you know, Brant Brown was hired, and he was the offensive coordinator, which isn't you know a typical thing in baseball, but he was going to help figure out how to score more runs and how to just be more productive as an offense. Up until May 31st, when, when he was fired, the Mariners were 28th in batting average, 27th in on-base percentage, 28th in runs scored, 19th in weighted runs created plus. They had a 28% K rate, which was first in MLB and on a historic rate. They were 16th in walk percentage at that time. And what I had heard was that some of what he had implemented was hunt the green box. That's something that I want to hear, you know, insight and what you've heard about it. Hunting the green box as in a certain pitcher will get most damage in a certain spot with a certain pitch type. So hunt that and try to do damage to that pitch. You know, I had Jamie Moyer, Mark Lowe, these guys on the podcast and I was talking to, to them about this. And Mark Lowe's like, I mean, hitting is so hard as it is. Like, how can you go up to the plate and try to have any other thoughts, you know, outside of see ball, hit ball, like Edgar Martinez, mm -hmm. you know, line drive out the middle, make contact. What are your, let's start there. The great Hunter green box, the Brant Brown era of, of this season. Yeah. Let's, let's contrast what we saw in September and what we saw during the course of the year. Cause I think that's exact. I think that's the point that you're driving at. And we saw a, massive change between the very end of the season and before that. And that was after changes, not only Brown, but obviously uh, JD too, as the hitting coach for the Mariners. So that was the shift. And you, if, if you ask me what the difference was between what we saw at the end of the season and what we saw before that, I think the answer is actually pretty nuanced. I think a lot of things came together for the Mariners to make that happen. One is when you look at the lineup, the players that were playing and in the lineup every day at the end of the season was better than they had fielded for most of the season. And Randy Rosarena was part of that. Uh, Victor Robles was part of that. Julio being Julio was part of that. Justin Turner on the field was also part of that. Like the players were better, I think. I also think Justin Turner had a big influence when you hear from guys. Not only was he productive on the field, but you can tell when you talk to different guys in the clubhouse that he helped with a mentality switch when it came to talking about hitting and how they thought about hitting and how they approached at bats. And one of the lines that really stuck with me when Turner was talking about it is uh, paraphrasing here, but uh, basically the first two strikes of an at-bat are yours and the third strike is for a team essentially. And it's whatever the team needs in that particular circumstance you know maybe you got to move a runner over or just get the ball in play you know something along those lines and so i think that really made a difference and then the third part of this of course edgar martinez who came in and talked about hitting differently than the previous hitting coaches had talked about hitting and so i think all of those things came together to help produce what we saw in september which is really instructive for me because i remember uh, when we talked about it, I think it was in July and we had talked about hitting and I had thought that the Mariners were going to have to, when it came to the off season, because when I feel back, when I look at the Mariners big picture and what they're doing, I think they're doing two things really well. They have pitching locked in. When you talk to outsiders, national folks, when they talk about the smartest teams, when it comes to pitching, Cleveland has always talked about, Tampa Bay has always talked about, and now the Mariners are in that conversation. Like you hear the Mariners well-respected in the game about what they do with pitchers and how they make pitchers better. Not only what they do at the major league level, but 
also uh, in the minors and getting people better. And we've seen the results of that, whether you're talking about the rotation or bullpen or whoever else. I also think they're drafting really well. And we've also, we've already seen some of that with, you know, pick your rotation piece outside of Castillo, that Cal who, uh, and Julio is an international signing, of course, but uh, they are drafting well. And I think we haven't seen all the dividends yet because sometimes it can take three, four, five, six years to see the fruits of a draft. But I think we will continue to see these dividends for a while. But I had said at the time that they were going to have to really tear down what they're doing hitting, not tear down, examine what they're doing hitting is the right way to put it. Really examine how they teach it, who's teaching it, how they talk about it, the players they acquire, like really look at the whole thing. And what was interesting was some of that was obviously happening during the season because they made a change. And I think we saw some of that come to the forefront in September. They did hit change how they were talking about hitting. They did change who was talking about hitting. Like they changed, you know, they acquired a couple of guys that made a difference. So some of those things already started to happen during the course of this year, which gives me hope moving forward that they will find some answers coming into next year because it was very different. So uh, long winded way to answer your question is just philosophy was very different how they talked about it. Absolutely. And from August 23rd through the end of the season. So the date that Dan Wilson and Edgar Martinez were hired as the manager and, and, and as the hitting coach, the Mariners were eighth in batting average with the 255, fourth in on base percentage with the 347, fifth in runs scored in the league, third in weighted runs created plus. They were 25% above the league average as an offense in total. They had a 23.7% strikeout rate. So it was 13th worst in the MLB instead of you know, dead last. I hate to say it, but it seems that they fixed what was wrong, but it was too little too late. It's like, you know, 162 games, any of those mm -hmm. single series, you know, if they win, win one, two games in any of those series, they're in the playoffs right now. And I hate to say it, but they're much closer then I think, I mean, they don't have to go out and spend the big dollars and, and bring in a ton of guys because they do have a lot of the talent in-house. And if they continue next year with that same hitting philosophy that they ended with, with Edgar Martinez as the hitting coach, keeping the anal analytics and all of the, the launch angle, the, you know, exit velo, all that stuff out of their mind and just go back to simple baseball, I think they're in a much better spot, especially with this rotation. Let's talk about Julio. I mean, you know, the Mariners have seemed to have gone kind of how Julio went last mm. year in 2023 when he had hot Julio summer, you know, July, August, he was the hottest hitter in baseball. Uh, he was the hottest hitter in history over a four game stretch. He had 17 hits in four games, you know, and then they went on their hot streak last year to get them back into a spot to compete this year. He struggled. Um, but then once Edgar Martinez became the hit, I think I've heard him from what I've seen. He started to produce. Do you do you have some insight onto who and some of the differences that he had? So watching this play out for Julio, I, there was some mechanical work. So I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna say that wasn't a factor because I'm sure it was with Edgar. I also think uh, I'm a believer in lineup psychology. Like I I do think that guys can feel stress when a lineup is struggling. And I think we've seen that from Julio when he really struggles. I think he feels the stress when the team is struggling that he has to be the man. And it comes from a great place. It's partly why we love Julio so much It's because he wants to be great. He wants the Mariners to be great and he knows they're relying on him. And when they're struggling to score and he comes up with two guys on, I think there were a lot of times early in this season or for a lot of this season that he felt like I got to hit the home run here or else we're not going to score. I don't think it's a coincidence that not only was he rolling at the end of the season, but he wasn't alone in the lineup and he could look around and yeah, Randy Rosarena is here behind me and Robles has been on fire. There's all these uh, Cal, of course, who had a phenomenal year, all these guys that were doing things offensively. I think 
It helps relax the mind when you're hitting. And as you already alluded to, hitting is hard enough as it is. And I feel like there's, if there's any added stressor and talking to enough hitters, I, I just, I really believe this. And this is the kind of thing that you can't measure. Uh, we measure everything in baseball. There's stats for everything, but there are, there's a psychology to the game that can really be hard to get at. And this isn't protection necessarily. This is just, I think, the, the root psychology of hitting, where if you're just relaxed and thinking the guy behind you is going to get the hit if you don't, that makes it easier. It's not easy because hitting is really hard, but we know when it comes to hitting in baseball, it's just different than football where you can play harder and it can make a difference in baseball. If you grip the bat tighter, if you swing harder, it's usually worse. That's the funny thing about hitting in particular, like the harder you try, sometimes the, the worse it can be. Like, I can't tell you when this team was struggling, how many extra swings they took and how often every guy would be there for early batting practice and spending hours and hours and hours, which is great. But at the same time, it, there can be too much, right? Which is a weird thing to say, but that's the nature of baseball. And that's why it's different than football or basketball, for example. Did you notice less trips to the film room, less iPads out during the game, you know, later on in the season? Was there a little less I, it's, it's hard for me to comment on that because we don't get a good view of it from where we sit because we're behind home plate. And unless we get a camera view of the dugout, uh, there's just no way for, for us to, for me to comment on that one way or another. I, I know that's still part of the game, obviously. And uh, for any good team, like you, you, you want to know, you want to analyze, you want to see what's going on, but it is, it's finding that balance. And I think it's the balance with everything. You know, it's funny because it feels like we've had this, this pull back and forth for as long as analytics has been part of baseball, which it has been for a long time now. And it's, it's kind of been, uh, sometimes I feel like this fight between old school and analytics going back and forth, but really I believe that balance is the best part is really what you're looking for. Uh, you want the balance of both. Because if you go too far either side, it's not going to work. I think balance is what you're looking for. And, I, and I'm a huge numbers guy. I love the numbers, obviously. And I think it's I, – I love being a fan of baseball in this era because I feel like we know more about the game than we have ever known. And the numbers have shed the light on things that – you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we had no idea how things worked in particular circumstances. And now we do. And I think it's so great. But especially when it comes to hitting, it's it's the hardest thing to do in sports. And I, I just I've talked to enough hitters. If you walk up to the plate, if, if you've got too much going on, it makes it that much harder. And it's not getting any easier because the stuff is getting more ridiculous year after year after year. So I, I, I think too, we'll probably have to help some hitters along with some rule changes as we continue to go. But uh, yeah, that's just, it's the balance, right? That's what I think is important. Right. Absolutely. Going back to, you know, when Scott service was, was let go, uh, we had, you and I had been talking about, Hey, this matchup with the pirates later on, do you want to see Paul Skeens versus the Mariners or no? And all that. And that, that, <laughs> That ended up being, you know, one of the last series that kind of was the the straw that broke the camel's back to where the Mariners ended up parting ways with Scott Service. You can comment however much you want to on how th that all went down, but then I, I also want to hear about th the differences that you've heard and seen um, as far as how Scott was managing games, how he was dealing with players versus how, it, you know, since Dan has stepped in, what the differences in coaching style and, and that looks like. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that series because the Skeens part was actually the best part of the series for the Mariners. I remember they actually, you know, for Skeens, they actually got to him a little bit, and but it was the rest of the series that was the huge problem. But, uh, you know, it was shocking because 
I mean, it's, Scott had been here for almost a decade, which in baseball manager terms is a lifetime. You, you just, you don't see that very often. And I, th- I think Scott is a good manager. Uh, and I think he will manage again at the major league level. But I think what we saw play out is exactly why it's hard for managers to go seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, because sometimes a change just needs to be made. Right. And it's not necessarily Scott's fault. I, I don't, I, I don't think anyone looks at him as, in this situation to say, ah, he was the problem. Uh, I think there was a, a number of problems that were going on. Uh, Dan though was the perfect choice for the time. I thought because he had instant credibility. I don't think I don't think uh, a lot of fans realize like how much he's been involved with the Mariners. Like he's we've seen him on TV, obviously, and at his radio once a week. But he's a guy that's been going out to the minor league affiliates for years and spending a week at a time in Arkansas or a week at a time in Everett. So he has grown up not only with a lot of the players on the roster now, and I think we all know about his relationship with Cal Raleigh in particular, but also with the coaching staff, like he was going to Arkansas and Pete Woodworth was in Arkansas. So he already had instant credibility walking in because he's been around, not to mention he's Dan Wilson Mariners hall of famer and that sort of thing. Like he, he already had all of that going on and he's, the greatest guy in the world. Like everyone, really, everyone loves Dan Wilson. And from from the conversations, like there was a real vibe change. And I say that not at a shot at Scott because I don't, again, this isn't his fault, but given the circumstances and everything going on, I think everyone can understand like it was really challenging and really difficult. But it was really uplifting when he came in and people felt really good about Dan being there. And and so that was kind of my perspective on how it played out. And, you know, it's funny because when we think of a manager or I think when people generally view a manager, I I think we always think about, oh, there he is making the pitching change in the sixth and the seventh inning or, hey, he's pinch hitting here in the eighth inning which is funny because I think that is actually, if you were just list out the importance of what a manager does in the course of the course of a day, like I think those are the very last things that are important for a manager. And in terms of what matters the most about what a manager does, because it is such a collaborative effort now. And it has to be like the days of one person making all the decisions for what's going on a field are over, which I think is great because no one person knows everything, especially now with everything going on. Like you don't want one person saying, I'm going by my gut here and I'm going with, like, you're not gonna win that way consistently. A manager is really a CEO and they are, they don't have all the answers, but they have people in house with the answers. So it's, it's getting the, analysts on the same page and your coaching staff on the same page and their communication and how they communicate that to the players. And it's getting a group in a clubhouse and think about a clubhouse. You've got people from all different kinds of backgrounds, all different kinds of experience, all different stages of their career. And you're trying to pull them all in the same direction. There are, there's so much going on day to day with a manager that I think is critical to have a successful organization. And, and that's why I think Dan's really unique because he has a lot of those abilities to relate to everyone, which I think is so important when it comes to manager, because you have to relate to so many different. Right. Absolutely. I, I'm thinking back to a, a series in Miami and so, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking of, okay, Ryan Bliss was three for three on the day against the Marlins. And late in the game, there was a right-handed pitcher. Uh, Scott decided to end up going to Josh Rojas as a pinch hitter for Ryan Bliss, who was already three for three on the, on the day. Like those types of decisions, I feel like aren't the same now. 
And so when you talk about, you know, it's, it's not just Scott making the decision, it's also the analytics in that prior case, would that be like him talking with Jared DeHart, who's then analyzing also and like, Hey, you should, maybe we should go here in this case. And that's where that decision at that point in the season with, with those coaches is now different because now with Dan Wilson and Edgar Martinez, it's not just a purely analytical standpoint. It's like, Hey, what are the vibes right now? What are the, the things that aren't on paper that you can't see, but this is the right guy in this spot because of where things are at and how he's doing right now. I don't think decisions are ever purely analytical or purely gut. I always think, I, I think Scott did this too. I think there was, it was Scott's decision at the end of the day. Like he got all the information and he made the call and that's how, right. That's how the Mariners have worked. Uh, but I think the information is pretty detailed in, cer in circum uh, certain circumstances. And I mean that by it's more than just, hey, it's a righty on righty matchup here or a lefty on lefty matchup here. Because you can go, hey, what kind of pitcher is he in terms of stuff? And how does that match up with a swing? Like you can get as detailed as that. And so, you know, it, it's funny because when an, when an offense struggles, I feel like a lot of that comes down to, or a lot of complaints, I guess, will come down to a platoon situation. People being upset about situations like that. Maybe a guy's three for three and he gets lifted for a pinch hitter or, Hey, why did a guy have three hits yesterday? And now he's not in the starting lineup today. And I feel like that's just playing the odds really. Uh, I remember a, a kind of a late, I can't remember exactly the situation, but Mitch Garver was pinch hitting late in the season off a lefty and he pinched it for a lefty. And really when you compare the numbers in the specific split, Garver was just a much better hitter. I, I wish I remembered who he was. I, it may have been Rojas. I can't remember though. Uh, was just a much better hitter against lefties than who he's pinch hitting for. And I think that's, that's going to always be part of it is playing the odds. And just because something has happened, the previous three at bats, for example, doesn't guarantee it's going to happen again. But there, you know, the guy's feeling good, so maybe you stick with him. Like there is some gut there, but I also think playing the odds is pretty important too. But again, I, I think that's that's balance, which is what I talked about before. Let's get into uh, so you know some of the offseason additions from the prior offseason. Mitch Garver, Jorge Polanco, we were you know ecstatic about these guys. Mitch Garver just came off of a World Series win with the Rangers. He, I made a video talking about how he was the best fastball hitter in baseball over his, you know, the past like four years, basically. Mm -hmm. Jorge Polanco, a career like 269 switch hitter, finally filling in that that black hole at second base that the Mariners have never been able to get production out of. They both, of course, come in and have ex extremely down years. Um, what are your, what did you see there? And is it just an, uh, another case of, you know, a player comes to the Mariners and, and has a down year, you know, what's going on there? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have all the answers there. I mean, yeah. the, the Garver thing was inexplicable for all the reasons you pointed out. I, I was super excited about Garver. And I, I remember our conversation was the biggest key was to keep him healthy through the course of the season. Like, right. I thought he would be a productive hitter uh, and hopefully they could keep him healthy for 400, 500 plate appearances. And it just, it never happened outside of, you know, a random home run here or there. It just, it never happened for him all season. And like moving forward, you, you, you just hope it's a throwaway year and he comes back and can be somewhat productive. And, He's got a chance, especially, you know, at, at the very least, he was serving as a backup catcher late in the year, which uh, we all know about the catching position. It's really hard to find production as a catcher. So I don't, I just don't have the answers. I, I can't explain what happened there because he also he's one of the guys where I, I've thought a lot about the park in particular. And 
how important it is for the Mariners to make sure who they bring in are good fits for the park. And I thought Luke Rayley, he was an offseason acquisition, obviously, was a great fit for the park. And he had a really productive season. I, he, In fact, when you think about the entire lineup going into the season and you think about your expectations for them, I think Cal probably even surpassed expectations for him coming into the season. And I, Luke Rayley is the second guy that really jumps to mind in that regard. I think he surpassed expectations. And part of the reason I think that he plays so well at the park is he's a huge exit velo guy. And when you look at some of the guys that have had success at T-Mobile Park the last few years, Cal, obviously, who's big barrel, big exit velo guy. Luke Rayley, who did the same thing this year. Julio, when he's been great, I mean, we see he lights up. Uh, Nelson Cruz, obviously, who's had huge success here, was along those same lines. Now, there are different styles of hitting that I also think works, that you know, the, the Justin Turner kind of sprayed around that we saw in September, or early Ty France, kind of that kind of hitter, who you know, didn't necessarily hit for a lot of power, but could spray the ball around or kind of the chaos that we saw from Victor Robles, who used a lot of speed, uh, could drop a bunt once in a while would, you know, what he would get, you know, he finished uh, second on the team in doubles this year, Victor Robles, who wow. barely played this year. And a lot of it was yeah. going down the line. Like he wasn't putting it in the air to the gap where it could be tracked down. Cause he's not a huge exit velo guy, but he could, use his speed. So I, I think there are different styles of hitting that works, but for fly ball guys, I think exit velo is important. And I thought we saw that play out with Rayleigh. Now we're getting back to the long point I was making and, and Garver has been a, an exit velo guy. So it wasn't, it wasn't like he was getting balls caught at the wall consistently or something like that, which we've seen happen to, to guys here, you know, the Jesse Winkers of the world, but uh, I don't know. I don't have a good explanation, and I'm just hoping for the best coming in next year. And Polanco, it's similar. And maybe Polanco falls into the, the ex Avilo conversation where he's just not a great fit for the park in half the games. But uh, I expect him to have a much better season. We saw, uh, at least for him, we saw a glimpse of about a month or a month and a half where he was actually really good. It was hard to notice in the overall numbers because he just buried himself in the first half of the season and when he you know it's just so hard to raise your numbers when you buried him but he was good for about a month and a half but then kind of fell off a little bit towards the end of the year and and to his credit too he was fighting through injuries for most of the season and playing through it like he he took the field most of the time dealing with leg stuff but yeah he didn't have the season either that i think we were expecting which they weren't alone. I mean, I mentioned it. Cal and Luke Rayleigh. I mean, are those the only two guys from the lineup at the beginning of the season that met expectations this year? I mean, that's a lot of underachievement. Right. Yeah. Victor Robles, he hit 328 with the Mariners, 20 doubles, uh, 30 for 31 and stolen bases with an 860 OPS, 77 games with Seattle. <laughs> and Luke Rayleigh. <laughs> He finished second on the team in home runs and slugging percentage as a part-time player. Mm -hmm. He had 98 hits, 22 home runs, 58 RBIs. Uh, when we traded for him, I dug into the numbers, and he was one of 10 players the year before in the 80th percentile or higher, both in sprint speed and I think exit velocity. Mm, he was yeah, potentially yeah. one of the top 10 like power speed combos in baseball, and he was – one of the guys that no one knew of um, there was guys like Luis Robert jr. Mike trout on that same list. So you give him more at bats and, and exposure. We'll see what happens and we'll get into the, you know, next year's roster and some of the offseason plans in a second. Um, do you, have you heard anything about the Mariners fixing the batter's eye or any changes that are going to be happening this off season to the park to, to potentially help some of the, the, problems that players have voiced opinions on yeah i don't know i don't know what we're gonna see uh if we see anything i'm not sure what's gonna happen yeah i, I it's funny 
Uh, part of this season that was interesting, uh, not only we talked so much about the offense for good reason, and I think the offense it, it really took most of the conversation during the course of the year. But one of the really interesting aspects to this team, the home and road splits from the rotation. Like the rotation at home was historically good. We mm -hmm. just witnessed – one of the greatest seasons of all time a home rotation has ever had. Like on base percentage, batting average, some of the best in history for a home rotation. And the ERA was great. Uh, I think the Cubs from their World Series year had the only lower home ERA since the early 2000s, which that was a really good rotation. So that's great company. What's interesting about that, though, as much as they dominate at home, their ERA on the road, and I know ERA isn't everything, but we'll use that as kind of an example here. It was about half, you know, about middle of pack this season. I'm not talking about yeah. history. I'm talking about middle of the pack in baseball this year. So, you know, there is this balance where the park is a big advantage for what the Mariners are doing on the mound. Not that they shouldn't fix the batter's eye if their hitters aren't don't like the batter's eye, but there, there is, there is an advantage here to use. And they're certainly using it on the pitching side, which is why I kind of alluded to it earlier. If they could find a way to build their offense more towards the park and really make this a huge home field advantage. And if you want to know why Cleveland is in the postseason right now and won their division you know it's funny how it developed because i don't know if it was necessarily on purpose because they they had construction and they they currently have construction going on at their park right now and the the results are that they have had it, it's changed the wind direction there and it's really affected left-handed hitters in a positive way like balls are flying out for left-handed hitters more than previous years and it just so happens that they have the second most plate appearances this year in baseball from left-handed hitters so <laughs> i don't know if it was planned this way like they had construction and oh we have a team that fit this but the end result is like they have this park that suits them perfectly and they went 50 and 30 at home this year one of the best home records in baseball behind just the phillies and the dodgers this year Wow. And they use their they use their park to a division title. So, I mean, maybe we'll see changes, uh, changes to the park at T-Mobile Park. Maybe we won't. But I, I do think it's it's worth, you know, when we talk about we talk about it from the Mariners offensive side so much. There is another side of the coin with that. And it's about Mariners pitching and how to use this, which this is the question that I think we have to answer is whether it's an offensive advantage or hitter's advantage, how do you use the park to your advantage? That's Yeah, as you mentioned, thing. yeah, the Mariners had a 2.85 ERA at home. The Mariners on the road had a 4.18 ERA on the road. And, yeah, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, again, in that conversation with Mark Lowe and Jamie Moore and all of them, Mark's like, I mean, the Mariners just need to make a team that fits that ballpark uh, exactly as you're describing instead of guys trying to launch balls that are not going to be home runs, they're going to be flyouts, or you're going to strike out a ton, have Victor Robles, you know, Randy and Julio, that, that outfield is speed. You know, Luke Grayley is a, is a power speed combo. Uh, fill out the rest of your roster with guys that have high contact ability, maybe some speed throughout. You got the, the boppers like Cal Raleigh and potentially some other guys that, that can run into power, but, you shouldn't be focusing on just trying to hit home runs and, and, and slug. If you could just have that approach like Edgar, line drive up the middle, find the gap, you're going to score a lot more runs, especially in that ballpark park, compared to the, the prior approach. And I think that's what we saw in the last month. We saw the balance of the lineup because they had a lineup that could do a lot of different things that you mentioned. Like Robles was doing his thing. Trey Turner was you know, spraying the ball around. And you still had... Julio and Cal and Rayleigh, they, you know, no park can hold them when they get into a ball. They have that kind of power, which is great to see. So there were some elements there that were really great 
that they can take moving forward. And I also, you know, September was great and the end of the month was great. I, I don't think we can go into next year thinking like, okay, everything's solved. Like there's still some work to do. And there's questions like, who is Victor Robles? I don't think we know the answer to that right now. I, he can't possibly be the guy we just saw for the final month <laughs> because that's like one of the best outfielders in baseball. <laughs> don't look at but, his nationals numbers. Well, that's the thing. It's like, <laughs> but I do think because of, in fact, I was looking at his WRC plus and uh, you'll like this in September. It's you got Otani who's two thirty four. And Robles, 192, then Aaron Judge, 183. <laughs> uh, but, uh, like, Robles, I don't think, MVP campaign. Yeah, like <laughs> I don't think we can expect him to be that because that's not fair. But I do believe, given his pedigree, given his age, given his skill set, given his comfort with the Mariners and what they want him to do, like I do think he can be a productive player. And I do think he'd be a productive starter uh, for the Mariners moving forward. I just... I don't know what a full year is going to look like. And I mean, the energy that it brings to the clubhouse and that for lineup, sure. that's, that's yeah. a, you know, another factor. And the last time that I was up in Seattle for, for media, I actually went up to Jared to heart and asked him, I was like, Hey, I mean, I heard that you did some work with him. And he explained to me that Victor Robles is an elite rotator, but with the, the nationals, he wasn't rotating in the proper direction. So it was leading to a lot of pop-ups and ground mm -hmm. balls but they just made a small tweak to where they changed his rotation into the right direction. And because he's so quick, you know, it translated to the insane power and his ability to hit it to all sides of the park. So that was one big part of it. And that might've just been the one little thing that was needed to where now it's a completely different career. And also moving from Washington to over here. And he, he chose the Mariners because of the spot that they were in. Um, you know, it takes all the pressure off of his back from being one of these top prospects for the past five years for the Nationals not performing. Now he comes to Seattle and is just integrated into a lineup that's ready to go. Mm -hmm. And now he just has to be himself. So we'll see if he can carry that into next season. And moving into, you know, this off season, let's get into kind of what's anticipated. I guess, first off, have you heard any information on if Dan Wilson is going to be here for how long um you know edgar martinez i've heard that he's going to come back in a very hands-on capacity maybe just for home games but you know from from how, how they've talked about it dan wilson is the manager moving forward yeah w what, what have you heard about all that yeah dan wilson the manager moving forward uh he'll be the skipper next year i, I know they want edgar back in some capacity i, I think what everyone should understand is how difficult and time consuming the job of a hitting coach is. And if you don't have to do that, like Edgar doesn't have to do that. <laughs> like <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't need a job. Right. But right. he loves teaching and he loves coaching and he loves to be around. But that, that thing, man, is a grind every single day. And I mm -hmm. talk about it all the time. Like when we're on the road and we're in walking distance to the ballpark, you know, I'll do my runs in the morning and it would not be uncommon for me to, there's Pete Woodworth and Jared DeHart walking to the ballpark at 10 30 AM for a 7 PM game. Like right. it is a 24 seven thing being a hitting coach. So uh, I understand if Edgar doesn't want the grind of that every single day, but I am confident that they'll find some, I don't know what it will look like. And I think Jerry alluded to this, that, you know, it will be maybe something unique, but he will, sounds like he will be involved moving forward, which would be great. I think that's what everyone wants. And then you put people around him and uh, hitting coach that will obviously be with the team day in and day out. So uh, I think that's something that would be unique and something that could benefit everybody. Obviously we saw the results from the end of the year. So uh, yeah. And I'm anxious to see what the rest of the staff will end up looking like as well. And they do have, they do have some wonderful, wonderful people on staff. Uh, and just for me to spotlight a couple Pete Woodworth has been Trent blank mm -hmm. have been phenomenal for the Mariners and what they've done 
on the pitching side. I, I just, I respect what they've done so much and just up and down the system, but headed by those two guys, it's been really impressive. And then moving into, you know, J Jerry DePoto, it hasn't been officially announced that he's coming back. It's assumed that he's coming back, but there hasn't been any contract extension announced with him. Um, have you heard anything about that? I assume that he's back, of course. Yeah, those keep, they keep those things pretty quiet. So, uh, yeah, and it gets back to something I was talking about before as well, is you know, when I think about the organization as a whole, you know, I think about the things that they are doing really well. And I mentioned them already, like the pitching side, they're crushing it. And, you know, I think about, we mentioned Bryce Miller in passing, but man, I can't get over the season that we just saw from Bryce Miller. Cause I think about where he was just a couple years ago when he was drafted, this was a guy that a lot of people thought would stay, would be a bullpen guy because of his arsenal. Right. And then we see him in the majors and he had you know, flaws, probably not the right word, but he had a lot to overcome and that lefties really got to him last year. And so coming into this year, it's like, what are you going to do against lefties? And there was no guarantee he was going to figure that out because some guys never do. And then maybe he does end up back in the bullpen because that's that's something you see in baseball all the time. Not only does he solve it, but he thrives. And the year he had was incredible. I, I think he's going to get Cy Young votes this year. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the best pitchers in baseball in the second half of the season. Like, fourth best ERA, I think, for all starters. And it's it's a who's who. It's just an incredible season. And the fact that they keep getting production from the Millers and the Woos of the world. And, you know, I think Miller, too, helped. You know, he, he was able to move things into light speed, I think, with the help of Logan Gilbert, who has made similar a similar transition to – a guy that came in with basically a fastball pitcher and has transformed himself into a great pitcher. But we've seen guys through the system, Gilbert and Kirby, and just get better and better. And we've seen them pull guys like Colin Snyder off the street and turn in a fabulous year. And then Troy Taylor, a, you know, a draft pick. He's not a first round pick, you know, and he, he was really successful this year. And we've seen this story play out on the pitching side so much. And so I don't, I think it's important that we don't take that for granted because, you know, with the, it's the people in place that are making that happen. Now the players are making it happen. Obviously they're putting in the work, but the people in place are helping them make this happen. I also think the draft, as I mentioned, is it's, it's going really well. And as evidence, they traded three picks from last year for Randy Rosarena last year mm -hmm. and not their first and second round guys. Right. Right. So I think those two things are going really well in the organization. They just need to figure out the hitting side. And I say, just, I mean, that's a, that's a big <laughs> part of it. Right. But it feels like, and hopefully that this is the case. It feels like they were able to get to some of those answers at the end of last season. And hopefully they can continue them on. And it, it it's a long way of saying like the person at the top sets everything else, all the other people in place are because of the person at the top. And generally, if you make a change at the top, there's going to be changes throughout. And so you don't necessarily stay as the, one of the foremost pitching teams in baseball. If the personnel changes out, I mean, one of the reasons that I think Cleveland and Tampa Bay have been, so consistent is the consistency in their organization. Even with people at the top for Tampa Bay leaving, they've kept the people underneath in place and they've been able to carry forward. So it's a long way of saying that I think they're in a good place, big picture. Like they're in a good spot, big picture. And they've been competitive the last few years at the major league level on competing for a playoff spot. They need to take that next step though. And it's, it's with the offense It's figuring out that side of the ball. And, and I think it's the answer is not one thing. I think it's, it, it's everything from the players you select from outside the org. It's from how you coach them and it's the players themselves. You know, we saw a lot of underachievement from players themselves.
So I think there's a lot of people involved in the answer, but that's kind of that's kind of where I'm thinking about Jerry and and big picture with the orc. Yeah, and it, it, it's almost frustrating that there isn't like more that's glaringly bad that you could just be mad about, right? It's like, okay, the offense is clearly where they struggled because as you mentioned, the rest of the organization has been phenomenal with the scouting, the drafting, the developing, you know, you could say hitters and, and pitchers, but the fact that and, they have, yeah. And the reason I say that, because I, I understand the frustration, man. Like I, I understand <laughs> fans are, are mad because they're not in the playoffs. Like I get that. I'm mad too. Like I wanted them in the playoffs right. too. So, and I get the reaction from people. The next step is okay. Fire, fire X, Y, and Z. Like you're frustrated, you're mad. They didn't get to where you feel like they should have gotten, where I feel like they should have gotten. So I feel like that can be the reaction. But I would caution that I think you'd be throwing away a lot of stuff that's working really well right now that they can build on moving forward. That's not a given. Like drafting well and being really good as a pitching organization, those are not givens. It took a lot of years to get where they're at right now. A lot of work behind the scenes, a lot of people that aren't household names doing a lot of great work that have gotten them to this point. So that's, Absolutely. that's where I'm coming from with that. Yeah. You mentioned Bryce Miller quite a bit. I have to give him his flowers, you know, last year uh, in 2023, he basically had two pitches against lefties. And against lefties, he gave up a 303 batting average and a 917 OPS. <laughs> he he learns that splitter this offseason, but then he was also adding in even more pitches throughout the season. He added the two seam, I believe that was this year at some point. He towards the end of the year added a curveball. Um, and looking at his splits this year against lefties, 208 batting average allowed, a 663 OPS against lefties. He dropped lefties batting average by about a hundred points and OPS by close to 300 points in just a span of one year. And Bryce Miller became the second pitcher in Mariners history with a sub three ERA and a sub one whip in a qualified season. The only other pitcher to do that was Felix Hernandez in 2014. Mm -hmm. Like you talk about all these guys, like, like we could talk about all day one through five, but Bryce Miller in his second full year is you know, just put in the best Mariners season that that a pitcher has had since Felix Hernandez in 2014. It was an incredible year. And uh, that was the biggest contribution Mike Bauman made when he was here. The Bryce Miller uh, that was took, the his, curveball. took his curveball grip and it's worked out great. <laughs> 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 Bauman wasn't here for very long, but uh, he certainly, certainly helped out when he was here. But yeah, I, I just think it's amazing. I can't get over the season that he had just because of everything you just referenced. And, you know, I always try and at the end of a year, I try and think back to what we thought of somebody coming into the season and evaluate or reflect on his season, given, given those terms. And, you know, Wu was in the same boat mm -hmm. because Wu had similar issues against lefties. And what's funny about, the difference is, you know, Miller made all these arsenal adjustments and everything. And we were just, ah, I'm going to throw, throw my fastball more. <laughs> and that was the solution. Four there, seam, but... two seam, 50% <laughs> yeah. of the time, just try yeah. to hit it. Yeah. Some of the games, 70% of the time, it was, it was amazing how I, I felt like there were times where he could say, I'm going to throw my two seamer probably down the middle. Here it comes. And it wouldn't <laughs> matter. They still wouldn't be able to hit it. Like he was, he was remarkable this year. Uh, it's just, it's really incredible to watch the rotation. And, and I think, uh, it's funny cause I was thinking about George Kirby specifically today. And, you know, I was thinking about his season where, you know, he had, he had a three and a half ERA. Uh, he set a career high in innings, a career high in strikeouts yet. I feel like we all thought there could be more this year, which that's not a shot at George Kirby. I, I think, we just all think of him as all-star top 10 Cy Young, you know, that kind of pitcher. And I think he's got a chance much like Logan Gilbert. I thought, you know, Logan Gilbert pitched better last year than the final numbers indicated. 
So I thought he could have a big year this year, which he had a massive year this year. I think George Kirby is on a similar path where I think next year could be a huge year for George Kirby. You look yeah, at his really... and everything else underneath. Uh, he, he pitched really well this year. Yeah. Uh, as you'd figure, he led the majors in strikeout to walk ratio at 7.78. He also led the majors in fewest walks per nine innings with just 1.1 walks per nine innings. But I mean, his peak is whenever he can get to like above one strikeout per inning. Cause that's in the tank with the stuff that he has. It's yeah. just a matter of expanding the zone even more than he's comfortable with to be able to get that strikeout um, percentage. But yeah, I mean, Bryce Miller, it was allowing a lower opponent's batting average uh, than Tarek Skubal. Bryce <laughs> Miller ha had an opponent batting average of 200 allowed. Skubal was 201. Dylan Cease is tied with Bryce Miller. Logan Gilbert is allowing a 196 against. And then the only guys above him are Zach Wheeler and Ronel Blanco. Hmm. That's great. That's great. But, it was just, you know, I think uh, my prediction, I think Scooble's going to win Cy Young unanimously, which he deserves. Uh, I, I think Gilbert's going to get inside the top five, which would be really impressive. And I think Bryce Miller's going to get some votes. So... We'll see. That yeah, I mean, work. looking at Fangraphs predictions, there's three Mariners starting rotation guys that are predicted to get top ten in Cy Young. It's uh, George Kirby, Logan Gilbert, and Bryce Miller are all projected yeah. to finish six through eight right now. That's incredible so, to think about. It really the is only, the only team you'd you'd imagine uh, that has three in the top ten. There's also you know Raggins and uh, oh Lugo, uh, yeah, Kansas City, yeah Lugo that are going to yeah. be top ten. Um, yeah. They're going to be top five, but let's run it back with this rotation, f fill out some of the offensive holes and, and see what happens. Yeah. And I, I also think uh, like they need to do some work on the bullpen as well. You know, right. Uh, some of, I thought the bullpen, the back end had issues during the course of the season. They got, we just with the struggles of the offense, it, just, it felt like it sucked up all the oxygen of conversation. Uh I felt like really the last month of the season was probably as stable as they had been in the back end all season. Munoz was consistent all year, but you know, because of injury, you know, no brash Santos didn't pitch, you know, the fire was right. hurt for most of the year. Those were supposed to be their big four and they lost three of them basically when the year started. So uh, I thought Taylor and Snyder really stepped up towards the end of the year and pitched well, but I, I do feel like they're going to have to find another arm or two at the back end. Because they did, they did lose some games late, and I know, you know, they pitch so often without margin for error, and guys give up runs. You're going to blow games when, you know, when you only have a one run lead consistently. But you know, you you think about how Detroit ended up getting the postseason, and what made Cleveland so dominant is their bullpens gave up nothing, and they were able to put those games away. And I think about the difference between the Mariners. In the playoffs and not in the playoffs, I mean, I look at one team specifically. I look at the games against the Angels as a prime example. Like, they went 5-8, and eight, I think, against the Angels, and six of those losses were by one run. And most of them were at their ballpark in games where some of them, the Mariners, had leads. And you turn around just a couple of those, you know, it's a different story. And I know that's what happens when you finish a game out, but – you know, they weren't able to take advantage of it. And, you know, you know, I thought about this a lot with the the wild card is the division is so much straightforward, more straightforward because every team you're competing with is essentially playing the same schedule as you, except for, you know, your your rival, essentially. The wild card is so different in that, you know, the Mariners were in competition with the Royals and the Twins and the Tigers, who happen to have the worst team in baseball history in their division this year. And going into the final series where Detroit had already clinched it, you know, those three teams were 34 and three against the White Sox combined. You know, they <laughs> just dismantled the White Sox, you know, like 12 and one, 13 and one. And, you know, the Mariners had a bad team in the angels that they didn't take advantage of. And those teams had, 
a historically bad team in their division, and they did take advantage of it. And you think about the Mariners finishing a game two games back from these teams, and you know they go thirteen to one against the White Sox. You, you, you know that that's the tough part about the wild card is like everything is not even when it comes to schedule. It's it's it depends on who's in your division, who's playing well. Sometimes when you catch teams, and so you know it's the margin for error is so small. And we've learned that lesson the last three years. Yeah. The, there was angels that they didn't perform well against, you know, the Oakland A's aren't the same A's that they have been in the past. They've got some solid talent on that team yeah. and in that organization. Yeah. Moving into the, to this off season, let's get into. So, so, you know, Jared Poto had a post or a post season presser and apparently Reporters were notified about 15 minutes before it happened. There was no recordings. I wasn't able to find anything, you know, you know that I can do anything with to try to figure out was what was actually said. It was all through write-ups. Um, were, were you at that presser? What did you take away from it? I guess the biggest thing that I heard was, you know, plans A through Z do not include trading, starting, pitching. I guess that would be plan Z. Um, what were your takeaways from that end of season presser? Yeah, it's funny. We've actually, I think we've gone over a lot of it uh, in our conversation because it's kind of the obvious, some of it's the obvious stuff. And the most important stuff is, uh, you know, it, that's an important part of, of what he talked about is not wanting to touch the starting rotation for good reason. Like you'd love to just run that rotation back. And he, he talked a lot about the offense and some of the things that we talked about and the impact that Edgar has had and the impact that Dan Wilson has had and what they can do this off season moving forward. And, you know, it's, it's tricky if you're the president of baseball ops, when you talk about it, cause you don't want to give stuff away and talk specifically about plans and, and what you'd like to do. Uh, he mentioned, which I think is the, the obvious when we talk about the offense, cause you feel great about what well, you're at a catcher. I think you feel really good about the outfield situation uh, whether you want to include Rayleigh as part of that four person mix or include him somewhere else, but the work's going to have to be done on the infield. And he mentioned first base specifically. It's easier said than done, you know, making the offense better in this off season, because, you know, you look at, I, I think free agency is becoming a harder and harder path because guys are, can get locked up and by the time guys get to free agency i mean they're 30 plus so you know outside of soto <laughs> who who is flawless there there aren't guys without flaws for one reason or another in terms of free agency especially at the position the mariners want to get better at and we're talking about first base second base and third base so maybe the mariners have a platoon and first base in mind with Rayleigh and maybe bring Turner back and make that your first base platoon. I don't know. That's an option, but they still have to get better at second and third and free agency wise, that's not going to be easy. So I think this is going to have to be kind of a, Oh, maybe trade, trade for one sign for one. And that's something I've been thinking about in this postseason a lot with the Padres and Brewers, both having big reasons why they are where they are because of, a young player within their system making a huge impact this year. And when I say young, I mean young, like 20 years old, young. And I wonder, I don't have the answer to this. I'm just, I'm just wondering. And the Mariners would know more about this than I would be because I haven't seen a lot of their young players play outside of spring training. But I wonder, do they feel like there is an impact player sooner rather than later? I mean, this is becoming more of a young player's game. Right. And we have seen it doesn't happen for everybody, but we have seen guys we've seen guys this year step up at a really young age with not a lot of pro experience and have a massive impact. The Mariners have a guy like that in their system. That can help next year. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Harry Ford, time to learn third base. Cole Young, you're at <laughs> second base opening day. Let's run it. Let's go. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Can they can one of them be part of an answer? Like trade for a guy, sign a guy. A guy from the inside. I don't know. I, it's going to be interesting to see how this offseason develops because, you know, they have work to do, and it's it's not straightforward how they get there given their positions they need to fill. And, and, there's and our, part of that, yeah. um, I guess I'm assuming they'll decline 
uh, Polanco, which they have an option for. So, do you think they'll decline him? It's just a guess. Because yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it's like he, twelve million dollars. There's no way that he can perform this low compared to his career norms. He was a career two seventy hitter from right. both sides of the plate. I mean, you know, his defense looked suspect at times, but I mean, I guess his predicted market value is like $5 million, whereas the yeah. club option is 12. So I guess yeah. you could decline that and then try to sign him again. But at that point, they'd probably go to another option. But John Sands already been quoted stating that they're not going to be going after the big free agents. So Juan Soto's out of the picture, even though he's, you know, 25 years old. Um, it's hard not to envision Juan Soto not going back to the Yankees at this point, but that's just yeah. me. I've got a Nationals fan that has hope, but uh, you know, it's not <laughs> <happening>. <laughs> going back home. <laughs> yeah, I mean they are going to be a fun team to watch with some of the the tools that they have or the guys that they have. Um, but then other other guys that are you know first baseman on the pre market, you got Pete Alonso, you got Paul Goldschmidt. You think that those guys probably aren't going to be coming over then everyone's talking about Christian Walker and I heard I was on Seattle sports where they were talking about, I mean, do you really think the Mariners are going to offer, you know, Christian Walker a four year, 18 per year contract, because that might be what it takes to get a guy like that mm. on the free market. Yeah. First you base. I, I, I'd love to see Justin Turner come back just for all of the, the reasons that we already talked about just the, not necessarily the on-field production, but like, you know, if he's, know. I've heard, I've heard people talk about the player coach thing, you know, to where he's, Really, really helping coach. Yeah, because I don't think you can count on a huge year of production wise at age 40. But if he was in a part of a platoon facing lefties at first base, and and that's the, the most important part of what Turner brings. And I think that's another lesson learned from this season is he was really able to help guide a lot of hitters and made a huge difference for guys. So I would I would be all for that. Uh and you have Rayleigh there as well who can play first if need be. So maybe that's not even the position. If you were to sign a guy, you'd go sign a guy. But then, like, you look at second base and third base, for example, it's not like those positions are brimming with free agent options to go to either. So that's what makes this tricky, I think. Yeah, there's more options in the outfield, and that's the one place you feel pretty set about. There's a guy at third base that, uh, you know, if, if the club decides not to pick up his option, could be could be solid. Uh, Eugenio Suarez. <laughs> is a I've heard of him. This off season. <laughs> I, I can't Good believe vibes only. The, Come on now. Dude, I can't believe the second half that he had. I, you know, his first half, he struggled so much. He was about to lose his job. I was wondering if that was going to be it. And then he just had a massive second half. I didn't see that coming. So I'm curious to see what his offseason looks like. He certainly, uh, I mean, he, he helped himself with his second half. That's for sure. Yeah, this July, he, it was great. August, he was batting 292 with a 782 OPS. Um, or sorry, no, July, or sorry, August, he had a 260 batting average. Then, yeah, he, it looks like the end of the year it was pretty cold. Actually, I, I, I reversed it. Okay, now we're looking at it correctly. September, October. He was batting 347, um, July 333. So he had a couple solid months towards the end. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, he runs hot cold. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of who he is. Well, awesome. Yeah. Really appreciate your time coming on, talking some some M's. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens this offseason. I'm sure there's gonna be some headlines. There's gonna be a lot to talk about. There's gonna be moves that are that are made that are completely out of left field, nothing that we could potentially come up with ourselves because it never is. But um, yeah, I really appreciate all the time throughout the season that you took to come on and and help uh, you know share some insight with the fans. And looking forward to our, our next conversation. Yeah, thanks, Connor. This was fun as always. Uh, thanks for helping me talk some of this through. <laughs> <laughs> you got it anytime. <laughs>